This is Thursday, May 3rd, 2012. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Frank Bud Rines, Jr. Welcome, Bud. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? March 9th, 1920. And where were you born? Reading, Pennsylvania. What is your current, uh, where do you currently live? Quincy, Massachusetts. Your marital status? I'm a widower. And do you have children? Five. Grandchildren? I, I do have five. Mm -hmm. I think I have uh, grandchildren. Between grandchildren and great-grandchildren, I think I have eight. Okay. What was um, growing up in Reading, Pennsylvania like? Uh, well, I only grew up there until I was uh, about seven years old. Mm -hmm. And I loved the country. What did your parents do? My father was in the real estate business. Mm -hmm. My mother was a housewife. And what happened, uh, where did you move to when you were seven years old? We went to California for a year. And what part of California? Ventura. Okay. And what was that like? That was a lovely section, really. and. Uh, it seems to me that's where they had the, uh, or I remember the uh, Parade of Roses. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing that, and I was pretty young at the time, <laughs> yeah. What uh, happened after California? Uh, well, my father was a Boston boy. He was born in Boston, and we came home to Boston. And what part of Boston? Uh, Dorchester first, and then West Roxbury when he found a house in West Roxbury. And where did you go to school? Oh, to the, the local schools there. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, graduate from high school? Yes. And which high school was that? Rosendale High School. Oh, you're a Rosy boy. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And what happened after high school? Well, after high school, <laughs> I ended up in the service. Uh, really bummed around for a couple of years mm -hmm. and I heard about the United States Maritime Service which sounded good to me as mm -hmm. a lot of kids I didn't know what I wanted to do mm -hmm. and uh, I heard about the Maritime Service and I signed up for it. Mm -hmm. This is just before the war. Around 1940, 1941? Yeah, okay. 41, yeah. Tell us what, was, what the Maritime Service was like. Uh, well, the Maritime Service, uh, I, as I say, I signed up and it was a case of you went to school for a year mm -hmm. and then you would go aboard a ship as, as an officer and uh, you would travel around on different ships in the Merchant Marine mm -hmm. uh, all over the world. And that sounded very good to me. And mm -hmm. so I, I signed up and uh, then, as luck would have it, Pearl Harbor came along and <laughs> they said, hey, report. <laughs> so I did. What, were you, what do you remember about Pearl Harbor? Uh, did you? Well, how did you hear about it? Yeah, I was driving along in my car. It was mm -hmm. a Sunday afternoon, and I remember hearing it. And frankly, I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. Mm -hmm. I had never heard of it. So, Bud, it is. You just heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor. You are in the Maritime Service, and somebody went like this. Mm -hmm. Tell us what happened next. Um, January 11th, mm -hmm. after Pearl Harbor, I reported to Gallup's Island, which was a school in Boston Harbor mm -hmm. that the Maritime ran, and uh, in, in which they educated us, and uh, 
quickly became actually radio op operators, radio officers, as they love to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, after, it was almost a year, I think it was October sometime I graduated. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, then you go on a ship from there on. And mm -hmm. I, I went on to a, a lovely brand new ship right out of Portland, Maine, with a Liberty ship, mm -hmm. the Noah Webster. And that started my career at sea. And what rank were you at the time? I was a chief radio operator. Radio officers were very, very scarce. Mm -hmm. And every ship had to have one. There was no way if they were in trouble that mm -hmm. they could get in touch with anybody. They had to have, it was the law, it still is. Mm -hmm. They had to have an operator to, on each ship. Mm -hmm. So I, I went on my first ship there. And what were your duties besides <laughs> being chief radio operator? <laughs> <laughs> to run the radio room. Uh, and, and of course, and the one thing they told us, which I remember, was the radio operator is the last one off the ship if there's a collision or a torpedo. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're on the Noah Webster, and where is the Webster going? Uh, we ended up over in uh, a little town called Bristol. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sorry, it's called Swansea in the Bristol Channel in Wales. I had never heard of that either before, mm -hmm. but that's where we were, you know. And incidentally, what those poor people went through over there, there weren't two bricks on top of each other in the whole town. Mm -hmm. The docks, the docks were still there, but the uh -huh. town was flattened. I'm sorry, how did, how was the town flattened? By yep. the bombing. Uh -huh. the, Russia, uh, the German bombing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had pictures of all of that, and unfortunately, the house was flooded. We live on the ocean now, uh -huh. and the house was flooded, and I lost oh, that's ninety percent of my pictures. Oh, what a shame! Yeah, yeah, wow. it was. Oh. Okay, so you're in the Bristol Channel, and uh, what's happening? What happened there? Yeah, what, ha uh, what happened once you got to the Bristol Channel? <laughs> we just waited <laughs> until they discharged the ship. The ship had a cargo mm -hmm. that it was taking, and it was foodstuffs and ammunition, things like that. Mm -hmm. While you were stationed at Swansea, did you uh, meet the locals? Some of them, mm -hmm. yes. They, they were, there was a place that they, I guess, reconstructed and it became a, a not a nightclub, but a place where you'd go mm -hmm. in the evening and you could sit and you could have a, a drink, a, mm -hmm. a lime, what was it? They used to drink, not lemon lime, but something, <laughs> uh, some English drink. and. Uh, I heard for the first time, you put your left foot out and you shake it all about. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they did have that uh, mm -hmm. in the evening. Yeah. Did the locals treat you all right? Oh, very, very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And being chief radio operator, uh, did you get off the ship from time to time or were you pretty much tied to the ship? Oh, yes. My, my time uh, in port, Mm -hmm. was completely my own. I could come and go as I felt like. Mm -hmm. I had no duties in board, only at sea. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And how long were you stationed at Swansea? Uh, probably, I think we were there about three weeks. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of bunny hopping for you. <laughs> it was, yes it was. <laughs> um. So tell us what happened afterward. Uh, after that, we came back to the uh, to the United States mm -hmm. to have another cargo mm -hmm. to take someplace else. Uh, I, I would like to mention that the the one time during the war where 
we weren't sure we were going to be around the next five or ten minutes, was on the way over. Uh -huh. We were under attack for I forget how many days, uh, and it was a constant, uh, constant time during that day when we were alarmed. Mm -hmm. Everybody was at battle stations, mm -hmm. and uh, that was probably, that, that was, as a matter of fact, they shot off our uh, rudder. And uh, we had to go into, they missed, mm -hmm. really missed the ship and hit the rudder. And uh, we had to go into uh, Halifax. Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate, we went in there, we were towed in uh, for, and I did my first job as a radio operator to mm -hmm. call for help. And uh, we were towed in. And uh, while they repaired the ship, we went out to a little motel outside of Halifax. And uh, lo and behold, I was the youngest one on the ship, the youngest officer. Mm -hmm. uh, I was 22 years old. At the time. I was 21 years old at that time. And uh, we uh, went to the motel and we stayed there, I, I don't know how many days and meals and everything. Mm -hmm. Let's, and the uh, captain went with me. <laughs> let's uh, step back a moment. Uh, when you're saying that your ship was attacked, first of all, were you um, heading over alone or were you part of a convoy? We were in the convoy. And second, when you were being attacked, were you being attacked from the air by submarine? Submarine. Submarine, oh. okay. So now you're back in Nova Scotia. You're getting mm. your rudder repaired. Yeah. Uh, tell us what happened after that. When we, were, when we left the little motel we were in and mm -hmm. went to pay the bill, found out the captain had paid my bill for me, <laughs> which was lovely. Very lovely. Yeah. Uh, what was your captain's name? Lee. Lee? And he was a direct descendant of one of the Lees from down south from the Civil War. Oh, wow. He was quite a man. You know? mm. Okay, so what happened after that? Well, after, after we were in Swansea and uh, we came back, got another cargo. Mm -hmm. And to tell you the truth, they were so mixed up, so many different trips, I don't remember where we went <laughs> <laughs> the next time. Okay. Uh, but most, it's, your trips were mostly to England? Uh, no, oh, not at all, no. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think the next trip we went to Puerto Rico and made a movie, believe it or not, for, a the, movie. for the Navy, uh -huh. and it was a training uh, movie. Uh, <laughs> in the middle of the war, here we are down in Puerto Rico, enjoying Puerto Rico, and we actually took uh, people with us to be actors, like we, one fellow was an ensign, uh -huh. and uh, he, he was there, I can still see him acting the part, you know, and uh, I never saw the movie, <laughs> but... Uh, what was the training movie about? Uh, uh, training, for training the armed guard, uh -huh. who uh, man all the guns and everything on a merchant ship. Okay. Because sometimes when you're saying training movie, it's uh, you know one of those things avoid VD and stuff like that. But this was an honest to god training movie. Yes. Yes. So how long were you in Puerto Rico? Three weeks. Mm-hmm. And that must have been different from England, now, wasn't it? Oh, we loved that. <laughs> yes, we loved that very much. And after Puerto Rico, uh, now this is getting us into well into 1943, right? 43 into 44? About then, yeah. All right, so tell us what happened after uh, Puerto Rico. Well, uh, I know we went through the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. we went to India, but uh, whether there was a trip or two in between, uh, uh -huh. I don't remember that well. You're putting on the I mileage, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I didn't keep a, a diary and the law was you don't have a camera. Cameras were mm -hmm. forbidden, although I had 
postcard permission to have my camera. Uh -huh. I, I had my camera, but it was forbidden to keep a diary. Uh -huh. uh, in case it was captured, it would give aid to the enemy. Right. Uh, so uh, that's why I don't know. But other mm -hmm. fellows were smart, and they they kept their diaries. Okay. I wish I had. Uh, so, uh, do you remember what India was like? Oh, very well. Yes. Okay. Uh, unbelievable. I I had pictures because I lost them in the flood. Oh. Uh, little kids in the middle of the street mm -hmm. eating from the garbage that was thrown in the street, you know. They were, they were either very wealthy there. Uh, we went to Calcutta mm -hmm. uh, is where we ended up. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, what we ran into, they were either very wealthy or they were very poor. Mm -hmm. We went to the Royal Calcutta races, I remember that. Incidentally, mm -hmm. the horses run backwards over there. Now, it's not the way it sounds. Instead mm -hmm. of clockwise, uh, okay. <laughs> it goes the other way. Yeah. That, that would have been a sight. <laughs> it would, <yeah. laughs> How long were, uh, now, how long were you in India? Oh, I'd say probably another three weeks, mm -hmm. probably, maybe longer. Now, in the meantime, are you keeping, um, how, how did you keep up with the war? By newspapers, by radio? The, well, of course, we, we had radios. I can't think of the name of them now. Mm -hmm. But we had a radio which I, I controlled, mm -hmm. and uh, that would play down in the cruise mess. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a speaker down there. So we got our news at sea that way, but when we were ashore, let's say in, in France, there was the Stars and Stripes, which was a daily publication. Okay. In fact, I think it was daily. I'm not sure of that. Now, was, uh, was France your next stop after India, or was there oh, another no. trip? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I don't, I don't remember. I mm -hmm. really, really can't think of it, whether it was or not. No. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's kind of shoot forward a little bit to the spring of 1944. All right. All right. And you were part of the Normandy invasion. That's right. Tell us uh, about that. Well... First of all, uh, I got there, we got there, mm -hmm. D, which is D-Day, mm -hmm. plus three, plus three days. So the really horrendous fighting and everything was over. Although there was still fighting, there was still sniping, mm -hmm. and uh, there were still planes occasionally came over and bombed at night. Mm -hmm. um, we were on 24-hour watch. They gave us, we didn't carry walkie-talkies on, on our ship. And they gave us, the Army gave us walkie-talkies. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, four hours on, four hours off, listening for advice mm -hmm. from headquarters. Uh, there were still bodies in the water. Mm -hmm. We uh, it was a beautiful beach, mm -hmm. as I recall. Uh, and you were at Utah Beach, were you not? That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you were still on board the Webster. Is that correct? Oh no, ah. no. At that point, it was the uh, William J. Worth. And was that another cargo ship? Another Liberty ship, brand new. We took that out of South Portland, Maine. Mm-hmm. Boy, you've had your, your run of good ships. Uh, yeah, oh, I was lucky all the time that mm -hmm. way. So let's get back to Utah Beach, D-Day plus three. Uh, you're still chief radio operator. Mm, yeah. Um, anything else that you want to say about what was happening? Uh, I'd like to say this, that uh, after we, uh, we discharged our cargo 
in a small boat, they call mm -hmm. them ducks. Well, as a matter of fact, they travel around Boston. Mm -hmm. You can take a ride in them. That's what they use, oh, wow. you know. Uh, I met a sergeant there. I want to show him. I met a sergeant. And he said the one thing he missed was ice cream. And I had, I don't know whether you ever heard of Midco. They were little cans, and uh -huh. you would put them in your refrigerator and freeze them, and you had ice cream. So I told the sergeant, I said, you come on out to the ship, and I'll give you some ice cream. So I did. I had it, and we had our own refrigerator uh -huh. in, the, in the mess hall. So... He came, he had his ice cream and everything, and he tied up his uh, his duck uh -huh. at our gangplank. So when he went back to go ashore, the boat was gone. His boat oh, no. was gone. And there's valves on it. When they come from the shore into the water, they open, before they do that, they open their valves and let any water that might be in the bilge out. Right. Okay, so now they, they're back. The ship was gone. They forgot to close the valves when they went back. So the ship sank. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> he, came, he came to us the next day. He came out, and he said he got ashore that night somehow or other. And uh, he came out, and he told us, he says, if he can only find it where it sunk, they would survey it, and he'd be home free. But if they didn't find it, they were charging it to him. He must still be in the army paying for that. <laughs> so that, that was a, an interesting mm -hmm. thing to me for, mm. for the poor guy. Oh, but dear. another thing happened, oh, there was, I started to say, there was a haul road. The ducks would come off, and they'd come out of the water, and yeah. then they'd go up a, a slight embankment and deliver their goods. Mm -hmm. And at the top of the hall road, there was a sign. I don't, I couldn't read the French, but it had two signs like that with arrows on it. Uh -huh. And uh, I took a picture of a couple of little kids, and they might have been eight, nine years old. Uh -huh. And uh, the sign was there, and I had that too. That was lost, the picture was lost in the flood. But when I went back two years ago to see Normandy, mm -hmm. we told the guy we went, we hired a cruise and went around, or what do you call it, a van. Uh -huh. And we went around and I told the guy who was fabulous mm -hmm. uh, uh, about taking a picture. And he, he asked me, oh, where was this, you know, and everything. I said, it was right at the head of the hall road. So after lunch, after we had our lunch, we all get in the in the uh, van and we go back, and he goes to the same spot, and the same sign was still there, believe wow. it or not. I think they put the correct directions uh -huh. down. You know, the the Germans changed everything mm -hmm. to to confuse us, but this guy found the same sign in the same spot. Uh, I forget whether I had my picture with me or not, you know. Mm -hmm. I, oh, we wrote to the mayor of the town telling him we would be there on a certain day and hope to f maybe trace the kids and uh -huh. see, them, see them growing up. But we didn't, we didn't connect there at all. Oh, sorry to hear that. Yeah, yeah, it was just... That would have been an uh, experience. Uh, so let's get back to the first time you were in Normandy. Uh, was that the only trip you uh, your ship made to Utah Beach, or were you uh, ferrying cargo uh, across? No, that was the only trip I made to Normandy. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what happened after that? Mm, let's see. Not too much. <laughs> <laughs> Things were going down after that. The uh -huh. war was was ending, really. You know. Mm -hmm. So do you remember? Uh, where you were that final year of the war? Were you still going across the Atlantic or to England? Um, I, I think so. I think we were still just going back and forth between mm -hmm. like New York and, and different places. Yeah, because 
handled up Nile and mm -hmm. and I had a week there too. Oh, how was Ireland? <laughs> uh, Ireland was lovely. A little we were we stayed in a little town called Bangor. Mm -hmm. You know, when we'd get ashore or anything, get off the ship. So we get off and we found a private home that we stayed in in Bangor, mm -hmm. and uh, the woman that owned it was lovely. Uh, we'd go downtown every night, and we'd come home, and she'd always have cookies or something there for us to eat, you know. Mm -hmm. That was lovely, and I I got for my two sisters two tablecloths, hand-embroidered, and they, oh, they were beautiful, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, that's about all I remember about okay. there. And was it uh, easier uh, for the ship to travel across the Atlantic later in the war, or were you still being harassed no, by... No, it, it was never easier. You, know, you never had the feeling you were safe. Mm -hmm. Never. Mm -hmm. uh, we, oh, we made another trip to Sherburg. Okay. And a uh, very curious thing. We docked in Sherburg once we got control of it. And uh, I got off the ship and I'm walking down the dock and I saw uh, an army patrolman there and I asked him, I said, how would I get in touch with somebody that I, I knew, you know, from the States? And he says, you've got a fat chance of finding him. I said, oh, really? I said, oh, what's his name, by the way? And I said, Adams. It turned out Adams was a direct descendant of John Quincy, but that's beside mm -hmm. the point. I said, Adams, and he says to me, Quinny Adams? And I says, yeah. He says, he's up in the office there on the dock. He, he was a major at the time in the Army. So they had phones on the dock, picked up a phone, called Quinny. I, I had seen Quinny's wife the night before we sailed because we knew we were going to Sherbert. Uh -huh. And she had a message from him. Uh -huh. So uh, 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 Quinny was surprised and everything. Mm -hmm. And I had a um, sea bag full of baby food for the nuns in the convent in Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, they were having trouble getting food. And I knew I was going there, so the convent made up this sea bag uh -huh. and gave it to me to take to them. So I had the sea bag and I told Quinny about it. So Quinny detailed a jeep to Paris for me to get some supplies but to take me up, so I did, mm -hmm. and I delivered the, the uh, supplies to them. And uh, that was interesting. He took me out to dinner to a nice chateau, a private home. And, well, I had a good time there. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Another stroke of good fortune. Yeah. Oh, I, I had some good luck now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay, good luck escaping the submarine. Mm, that very was good the luck. luck. Yes. So uh, tell us about the end of the war. The end of the war, funny. I just sat and I, I remember I was playing cards when I heard about it in a private home. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the home that we own now that we live in. And uh, that, that was it. Um, so you were in Quincy when you heard that the war was over? Yeah, and I didn't. We didn't do any celebrating or anything uh -huh. else. Uh, there was a marine flyer that lived around the corner, and his wife told me, go up and say hello to Bruce. You know, he feels very bad with all his friends that he lost, mm -hmm. and I did. Yeah. He was lost after the war, took off from the carrier and just Oh, straight my. down, yeah. Um, After the war, After imagine the war. It. It Incredible. Yeah. So, I should tell you one, one experience. 
was on the Noah Webster mm -hmm. uh, on our first journey. Um, you sit in a, the radio room is just a little room with mm -hmm. your transmitters and everything in it. And it's encased in concrete, you know, because when the German subs, if they, if they surface, that's the first place they try to hit uh, is the radio room so that you can't communicate. Uh, so I'm um, in, we were at general quarters and I'm sitting in my radio room, <laughs> the hardest thing I ever did. And uh, all of a sudden, as I say, we were at quarters and all of a sudden you hear the gunfire. Well, they're blasting and blasting away, you know, and then all of a sudden I hear, hold your fire, hold your fire. And uh, so they stopped firing on our ship and the rest of them too. And it turned out they were firing on a lifeboat from the ship that was in the, if you know how a convoy is formed, uh -huh. the ship ahead of us had been hit and was sinking, it was burning and sinking. And they got in the lifeboat and we were coming past them. And I suppose young kids, you know, they thought it was a sub, uh, it was a sub, the white from the lifeboat. And they fired on it, on the fellows in the lifeboat, you know. I, I never knew whether they hit anybody or not, you know. Oh, God, I but, hope not. Uh, yeah, I hope not. But that, mm -hmm. that was uh, probably the, the closest uh, I ever came. Oh, no, it was tough to sit there and listen because that was my duty. Mm -hmm. and, and you didn't. You didn't know what was going to happen uh, next, you know. Mm -hmm. All you heard was the firing, you know. Mm -hmm. That was tough, huh? So the war ends, and what rank were you? You were still senior uh, chief, uh, chief radio officer. Ship's officer, mm -hmm. uh, chief operator, huh? And after the war, what did you do? I went back to my father's office in real estate. And don't ever work for your father. He's the hardest man in the world to work for. Mm -hmm. And were you married by this time? Or did you marry? Y yes, yes, after okay. the war. Yeah, I mm -hmm. got married just at the end of the war. Mm -hmm. And did you join any service organizations? No. No veterans groups? Name them. I, I belong to all of them. I, the I belong to the DAV, mm -hmm. the American Legion, Yeah. the, the vets. I don't know, I've got VFW? all the <laughs> in my black. Oh my goodness. All the VFW, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I think I belong to Mm -hmm. Just about all of them. Do you remain active in any of the organizations? I'm not really. I'm supportive of them, but I, I'm not active with them. Uh, in fact, one of them, uh, we meet in the Maritime Academy down at mm -hmm. Cape Cod once a month, and we're just having our last meeting this month mm -hmm. because we've lost so many through attrition. And, mm -hmm. Uh, there were only you know, seven fellows at the last meeting. Wow. Mm -hmm. so we've lost them all. We're disbanding. Mm -hmm. and what was the, what's the name of your that organization again? Uh, American Marine U.S. United States U.S. M.M. Mm -hmm. W. 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 Two. Okay. Yeah, it's a long one. It is a long one. Mm. So did you, any of your children uh, enter the military or your grandchildren? I just got married. Mm -hmm. uh, well, <laughs> let's uh, jump a few years then. <laughs> uh, uh, no, no, no. Oh, yes, my oldest son mm -hmm. uh, went in the Army in some kind of a training program they mm -hmm. had. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your oldest he, son's name? Joseph. Joseph. He he became a veteran. He is a veteran now mm -hmm. because he was still in oh, before they declared 
the war was over. You know? Okay. Now let, we'll get back to the end of your war. You're in the, the real estate business with your father. How long were you in that business? Oh, a couple of years. A couple I guess. of years. And um, then what happened? Um, well, um, disagreements, I guess. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I went into uh, heavy construction, actually. Mm -hmm. I went with the Perini Corporation from Framingham, mm -hmm. who was a wonderful and is a wonderful outfit. Mm -hmm. And I worked for them for, I guess, about 19 years. And what happened after you went to Perini? Did you retire or did you uh, take other work? No, as a matter of fact, I started my own business okay. in a, a fairly new line of work, like mm -hmm. contracting. Uh, you want to know what it was? Go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've probably driven along highways and seen trucks with a holes out the back, a big holes down yeah. into mm -hmm. a sewer. Well, we used those trucks. We had two of them. And in the power, we did all power generating work. Uh, the power generating plant, they when they burn their fuel, then between the fire and the chimney that goes up, big thing up in the air, mm -hmm. there's a, a room, an interceptor room, and they they pick up the fly ash that normally would go out into the into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, that fly ash is like talcum powder. Uh, it's uh, vanadium is mixed in with that fly ash. It, uh, it's a derivative. It's mined. It's mined, and it's also a product of burning Venezuelan oil. Mm -hmm. And of course, the room fills up with talcum powder and has to be cleaned out. Right. So we used to run our pipes. We had 12-inch aluminum pipe, and we would run it sometimes up eight mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. You'd run it up, and then you would—it's like a big vacuum cleaner—and mm -hmm. you would suck it out. And they—they they usually had a place to, mm -hmm. to dump it, and uh, most of it was sent back to Japan and and salvaged uh, to get the vanadium from it. Okay. We did that and it was very lucrative until mm -hmm. I got an exposure to the vanadium, oh <laughs> which I understand our favorite government notified every power generating plant in the country of the dangers. It was radioactive, which we didn't know, and uh, my whole crew, um, I was a boss. My whole crew was dead, and uh, they were young fellows, much wow. younger than me, mm -hmm. and apparently died from the vanadium. Well, I am did. sorry to hear yeah. that. Mm -hmm. How important was it to you to serve in the military? Uh, to use what? Um, how important was it to you to serve in the military? I'm not reading you. Okay. I'm not hearing you. Um, okay. Oh, well, how important to serve? To serve, yes. Uh, I just never thought about it. I mm -hmm. had already signed up when Pearl Harbor came along, mm -hmm. so I stayed right there. Couldn't get a better job than what I. Mm -hmm. You know, if mm -hmm. if I. Uh, so I switched over to the Army, I uh, went uh, over to the Navy, I'd have been uh, in a boot camp, you know, and, and started over. And here, I don't think they would have let me, uh, not after being in school for a year. Mm -hmm. you know? Is there anything else that you'd like to um, say to those who are going to be watching this in the future? Go to what? Is there anything you'd like to say, uh, anything else you'd like to say uh, for those who are going to be watching this in the future? Yes. I think every citizen that has the chance 
should go mm -hmm. and see Normandy and see what our boys went through. And if I may, the, the, uh, on the beachhead, the water runs, they'll be like, I call them rivulets, will mm -hmm. run along horizontal to the land. And it might be deep. Uh, the water here might be two feet deep, and five feet away, it's 10, 15 feet deep. And a lot of our fellas drowned there. Mm -hmm. uh, also, if you put a, a drop of blood in a glass of water, it'll turn the whole thing red. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy told me this on the trip, and he said, and see right there, uh, uh, this was up near Point de Hoc, which is very famous. He says, mm -hmm. that rivulet, as I call it, that day, he said, ran red with blood from the men. I, I forget how many thousand we lost. But to see, you look at a cliff and, and think, how could they possibly have ever gone up that cliff and then conquered the, the men at the top? But they did. Mm -hmm. Of course, we had tremendous losses. But, uh, I mean, it would make you appreciate the United States a lot more, I mm -hmm. think, if they saw that. I'd love to see everybody go. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm thinking of going back. Well, I, I mm. hope you do. Mm. Okay, yes, tell us about the time you were near Sable Island. Okay. Tell us what happened. We were returning f from Normandy. Mm -hmm. The ship was empty. And uh, you know a convoy, the way it's formed and columns and all that. So I was 22 years old at the time, and... Uh, after breakfast, we had been out two or three days from Normandy, and after breakfast, I took a, a bearing uh, with the direction finder. Mm -hmm. And I, I took a bearing on Halifax and also on New York City. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know about where we were and how soon we'd be home. Uh, I took the bearing at 8 o'clock in the morning, and uh, approximately, and uh, I took it again, I guess, after lunch, which would be 12.30. And the bearing didn't change. The bearing on Halifax didn't change at all. In other words, we were still going in a straight line towards Halifax. Mm -hmm. Now. I, I took that bearing over land, and that isn't accurate. Uh, it can be distorted. So uh, in four or five hours, the bearing hadn't changed, and of course it should have changed for New York City. Mm -hmm. So I went up and told the captain, the, incidentally, the radio room is right next to the uh, bridge, you know, mm -hmm. and, so I went and I told the captain, I said, Captain, I, I told him what I did, you know. I said, it was still heading towards Halifax. So the, uh, the old man, as we call him, he came down and he ran that uh, direction finder. He could run it better than I could. <laughs> he had more experience. But he took the bearings, he took it too, and then he turned to me and he says, I'm leaving the convoy. Well, each captain is responsible for his own ship, never mind. They take orders from the Commodore, but they're mm -hmm. responsible. So he, we took a, we were in what we call the coffin corner, which is the right rear. Mm -hmm. The subs could get at that one easier. Mm -hmm. And uh, we took a, a right turn. Uh, and, and we were going to circle in back of the convoy to get over away, oh, I guess I am made a plane, between Halifax and our ship mm -hmm. over land, and the land was Sable Island. 
and it, it was in heavy fog, by the way. So um, here we are, and we're heading uh, we're heading towards Saint Lyman, and the captain brings the ship around to the right, and. Uh, we no sooner left the convoy than a British corvette came alongside and with the bullhorn, the, the captain says, uh, you have a little of trouble, captain? And the captain says, no, but I think he's on a bad course. Uh, well, the captain of the corvette swore and he says, I told him he was on off course. And uh, he says, carry on. <laughs> And off he goes in his little, little Corvette up mm -hmm. towards the Commodore. So we swung around the rear, and we were just about in the rear of the convoy, and we hear the emergency turn. You could, you could signal with the whistles, you know, mm -hmm. and we hear emergency turn to port side, which would take them away from right. Sable Island. Mm -hmm. So we just kept going around and we went right back into our beginning place, mm -hmm. and that was it. But I often wondered mm -hmm. what would have happened if we had uh, right. kept on that course. And Did you uh, receive any commendation for that? <laughs> I don't even know if it went in the log book. Who, who wants mm. to have something like that in the log, you know? <laughs> so I, I don't know. And then I, then I thought about it the other day, and I was wondering if I could look it up, you know? Right. I, I don't know. Um, speaking of which, did you receive any medals or commendations for your service? Yes, uh, many of them. Uh, but they, uh, they, they didn't, you know, what did we do? We sailed in a ship, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not like the poor guys that were in the trenches and all that. Right. And when we went back to Normandy two years ago, uh, I don't know how, but at noontime, we would be in a certain spot on the on the land, and up uh, comes the car, and it's the mayor of the town, and uh, he got out and came came over, and presented me with this medal mm -hmm. of uh, Normandy. I never really read it until today when they showed it to me. Right. And oh, I must tell you this. We all thought when we were in Normandy and the people we met, we thought the French hated us, mm -hmm. and they acted that way <laughs> was in that, that particular little group. Uh -huh. And they'd sell you a bottle of Calvados for uh, fifteen dollars for a little mm -hmm. bottle. You know, they they made money on it and everything. And as I say, they we thought they hated us when we went back. Mm -hmm. They couldn't do enough. People stopped me on the street, knew, knew I was part of the group, shook hands and want to thank you and all mm -hmm. that. Was, uh, they love us. That, that's terrific. people in Paris mm -hmm. and all that. Uh, mm -hmm. well, that's uh, that's mm -hmm. all I can say, you know. And one other thing, I understand your sister was in the Marine Corps. Yes, yeah, she was. And what's, uh, what's her name? Hay, H-A-Y, Frances Hay. Okay. And incidentally, she and two other lawyers wrote the Uniform Code of Justice. It was all redesigned, if that's the word you should mm -hmm. use, at that time at the beginning of the war, uh, regards prisoners and all that. And uh, she and two other girls, lawyers, mm -hmm. rewrote the whole thing. She was stationed in Mojave. Mm -hmm. And uh, met her husband there. Mm -hmm. He retired full colonel in Marine Corps, mm -hmm. which is no slouch. No, definitely not. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Bud, I thank you once again. Um, and it's been a pleasure. It,